Good morning, everyone. And finally, it's time for me to talk about Starship again. But before I do, two things. Number one, if you haven't seen my 90K blowout celebration or whatever the hell I called it, please, please watch it. And here's why. A 14-year-old viewer of mine um, can't believe how much she loves my channel while other kids are hanging around listening to awesome songs like Gucci Gang, masterpieces like that. She is in, she spent hours of her time at building me a rocket, making fun of Star Starliner and Blue Origin and all that. She spray painted a bunch of onions blue for it. I mean, she put a lot of time into it. And then after that, her dad um, essentially used the maximum legal amount of fireworks to create a hell of a display. And by the way, for my American viewers out there, in spite of what you might think, the maximum legal amount of fireworks in this country would get you arrested in almost every state in the U.S. We like our guns. They like their explosives. This thing was so powerful that it destroyed a steel door on a concrete bunker. It ended up being significantly more powerful than we thought it was going to be. Yeah, there was shaking photography because we were scared out of our wits. Um, and as a matter of fact, at the end of it, a police helicopter showed up. But once again, they're familiar with this guy who runs the big fireworks shop uh, here in Liverpool. Um, great organization, by the way. If you ever want fireworks and you live in the UK, that is undoubtedly the place to go. But, you know, they passed by and the, the minute they saw where it was happening, they knew what was going on. They're like, eh, it's that crazy bloke again, you know. And so, uh, you know, everything was fine and they didn't even, didn't even pay us a, a second glance after that. But it was a hell of a display. If you haven't seen it, well, I'll tell you, some people invested some serious time in making that happen. Check out my direct cut of that. All right, quickly, number two. If you haven't seen my tour of Spaceport Cornwall, please watch it. It's just awesome. Um, I've never seen a spaceport before. I've never toured a spaceport, that is. Of course, I've seen Boca Chica, but I never got to tour it. Or I've never seen a clean room where payloads are integrated into uh, rocket housing. There's so many things that I got to see, exciting things that are going to be happening at Spaceport Cornwall. And then I'm coming back on the 10th to actually watch satellite integration into Launcher 1. I mean, that's just astonishing and something really that I have no business even being allowed to do, but they're allowing me to do it between Spaceport Cornwall and Sierra Space. Those guys are just fantastic. They've been so wonderful to me and given you guys access to some awesome content. Let's get back to Starship. So Elon, again, has been posting on Twitter, as he often does, talking about it's very, very likely that Starship is going to launch in November. Now, he's said these sorts of things many, many times, and it may surprise you from the title of this video that I actually now believe that that's possible. And I do believe that it's actually possible from a technical standpoint, but there are quite a number of things that still need to be done, and it goes way beyond static fires. And we're going to cover all the details of what's necessary before SpaceX can make this historical orbital launch in just a moment. So for those of you who think that I've kind of changed my tune on all of this and have been thinking that Starship really can't go to orbit before 2023, this is why I kind of have slightly different beliefs at this point. We've seen the Raptor engines now static fired in larger groups. Everything seems to be working out well. So if everything goes according to plan, yes, indeed, this ship can launch in November. There are a number of steps, however 
however, that they have to go through, and after extensive consultation with people in the industry and tank farm watchers everywhere, this is the list that I've compiled. Number one, they need to have a successful wet dress rehearsal. We have to keep in mind that even though the stack has been put together a couple of times, everything was empty. We've never had a situation where all 100 tons worth of stainless steel on the orbiter plus 1,300 tons worth of oxidizer and propellant have been stacked on top of the booster. That's a very important moment, and there are a lot of unknowns there. Everything is really theoretical when it comes to whether or not this ship is actually going to be able to withstand all of that structural stress, and so all of that needs Needs to be handled in the same way that it's been handled with Artemis. Make sure that there aren't any leaks, any other problems with the system. It's going to have to go remarkably well before they can even consider an orbital flight. Step two, they need to test fly the booster first. And that's why I believe Booster 7 is not actually going to orbit. Now, there are many people who are going to strenuously disagree with me on that, but here's why I think I'm right. It's extremely important to the FAA that SpaceX demonstrates that Starship is easily controllable and airworthy, and it would be easier to do that if they test the booster before they test a full stack. As you can see here, the narrow paths available from Boca Chica put a number of locations at risk, some very sensitive locations. For example, Havana, Cuba is right here, and if something were to happen, Happen with a full stacked starship and even if they did use the flight termination charges at that point debris would still most probably rain down on Cuba's capital creating a major international incident so they need to demonstrate that both the booster and the orbiter can be controlled and are flight worthy and even though they kind of have that right now with the orbiter part because they've flown starship a number of times they haven't done that with the booster, and I feel they're going to have to do that before the FAA is going to give them a permit for a launch license, which they haven't given yet. The PEA is not a launch license. Even though they're pretty similar, the PEA doesn't matter one damn bit without a launch license, and I really don't feel that the FAA is going to award that to them until they have demonstrated the flight worthiness of of the vehicle first, which means suborbital tests, which by the way is built into the PEA already. Suborbital flights are going to be necessary before they go for a full orbital test. Now, just to be clear, Elon would absolutely not want to do things that way because it's entirely possible that he's going to lose at least one and possibly two boosters in this process, therefore losing 33 or 66 engines. That is not a good thing at all as far as cost effectiveness is concerned. It would be much better to at least try to get Starship into orbit along with a whole bunch of Starlink satellites and turn it into into a profitable endeavor, even if he loses the entire ship. That's what he would prefer to do. But I am very confident that the FAA is not going to let this whole thing fly to orbit until it's demonstrated some suborbital flight worthiness. Once again, just my opinion, but I think I'm right about that. But we also need to talk about the static fires. Now, one of the reasons, probably the most important reason that I become more optimistic about Starship's chances here in the next few months is because of the success of their static fires. They've done a number of them at this point, gradually working their way up to larger numbers of engines until they finally climaxed at a six-engine static fire that went extremely well. There have, however, been complications here and there. We remember, of course, the explosion when they tried to 
spin up all 33 engines at once, and then of course the grass fire that started in conjunction with a very successive sta a successful rather static fire. All of these things add lots of complications. They're probably going to need to test the entire inner ring on the booster, then the entire outer ring, then all the engines on the booster, and then probably attempt a full-fledged static fire on the entire stacked vehicle. I have a feeling they're probably going to do their full range of static fire tests with the booster by itself before they actually try to do static fires with a fully loaded orbiter on top of the booster. So lots and lots of static fires that we have coming up. The good news is a lot of this can be done without the FAA's approval. They've already been approved for all the static fires they need to do on the booster, on the orbiter, on the stacked vehicle, as long as it doesn't involve flight, they can do it. So the wet dress rehearsal, the entire static fire campaign, all of that can be done prior to FAA approval for an orbital flight. However, after that point, as I said, I think it's very likely that they're going to do at least a short test flight of the booster, maybe attempting to land it at the same time, and then perhaps a suborbital flight of the full stack before they actually try to go orbital. They really need to prove that they're going to be able to fully control this monster before they send what essentially amounts to the mother of all ballistic missiles hurtling out over the Gulf of Mexico. This is not a simple matter, nor is it entirely safe, and they're going to have to really thoroughly demonstrate to the FAA that this is going to be a safe process before they actually go to orbit. So there are a number of steps, but all of these things are technically possible. Given how fast SpaceX can get things done, they could do the wet dress rehearsal, they could do the entire static fire campaign, they could then subsequently launch one of the boosters to demonstrate it on a suborbital flight, followed perhaps by a full stack on a suborbital flight, and then go to orbit. All of those things could be done in very short order, considering how rapidly we used to see tests happen back in the old days. Of course, they need to also make sure that they're being safe about all this, especially given all the various issues that have come up during this static fire campaign, the fire that broke out, the explosion, that sort of thing. We really need don't know what a 33 engine static fire is going to do, the effect that it's going to have on the surrounding landscape, lots and lots of unknowns that are going to have to be fully addressed as we continue towards this historic orbital flight. But technically, all of these things can definitely be done by the end of November. It's more a matter of satisfying the bureaucrats at the FAA. But in all fairness, I think that they should be satisfied and really the safety of everybody who happens to be in Starship's path, both on the ground and also citizens of Cuba, unsuspecting people who may not even know that this is happening, their safety needs to be taken into account before this is attempted. In many ways, it could be argued that it would be better to launch this beast from Cape Canaveral because there's nothing in its way there, but it doesn't appear that that's what's going to happen because it would take a very long time to get the Cape fully ready for an orbital launch. And on top of that, Cape Canaveral is not fully satisfied that a orbital launch from Starship is going to be entirely safe for the pad surrounding the new launch tower that Elon is building at Cape Canaveral. So there are many government agencies that need to be satisfied that an orbital launch is going to be at least relatively safe before they're going to allow it to fly from pretty much anywhere, which is the least that we can expect for the most powerful rocket in human history. But once again, to emphasize, technically, I think it can be done. It's just a matter of satisfying all the powers that be 
see that this is going to be a relatively safe process for all involved. And I, for one, am pretty grateful for that, given the fact that I'm going to be watching this thing take off from a mere five and a half kilometers away from Starbase Ranch due to a very generous offer from the owners there. I am eternally grateful for that, and I can't wait to bring you footage of this launch up close and personal in my own unique uh, fashion. So in any event, bottom line, yes, it can be done. Will it be done quickly enough to satisfy everybody involved? That is a big unknown. Do I feel that it's likely that that will happen by the end of November? Well, no. To be honest, I still don't. I still think my bet that Vulcan, which doesn't have to go through all of these bureaucratic processes, is more likely to complete its mission before Starship actually has a successful orbital test. And let me tell you something. I'm not really happy about all that because you can, as you can see, we have some big, big things in store for Starship in the future. Not just Mars. Obviously, our first mission to the moon and Artemis 3 is also dependent on Starship. We need to not only get it to orbit, we also need to get it to orbit with a rapid enough cadence in order to make LEO refueling a realistic possibility, and all of that needs to somehow happen by 2025 or 2026. So yes, the clock is running, and we need as little government interference as possible to get this process moving if we want to return to the moon in a timely fashion. I certainly want that to happen, so I certainly hope that Starship takes to orbit as rapidly as possible. Smash that like, hit that subscribe, hit that notification bell button. Please don't forget the two videos that I mentioned at the very beginning of this particular piece of content. And as always, stay angry about space!